It's hard to believe that only a few months have passed since the reopening of our doors, and a brand new season of exhibitions is already here. Since December, we've welcomed nearly 170,000 visitors. Wow. Yay. <laughs> With 60% more gallery space and our one-of-a-kind interactive experience. Provocations, the architecture and design of Heatherwick Studio, organized by the Nasher Sculpture Center and curated by our Deputy Director, Brooke Hodge, reveals the design process and concepts behind 43 of Heatherwick Studio's innovative products and buildings. The idea here is how can you deliver a brochure to a visitor in a way that really engages them in the exhibition and in the process of receiving the brochure. And so, um, if would you like to just to crank, crank your own one of these? So if, if you just kind of crank it and rip it. Um, when it's Growing up, my experience was that buildings were all very, very flat and lacked detail and um, texture and soulfulness and had become quite sterile. In our starting phase, we were not being offered big um, building projects to design. You know, it takes a long time to get trusted to work on multi, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollar projects. And so this is um, an early example called the Belsé Statutory. It's a pavilion, a small um, pavilion on an estate in England. And you can see the similarity to the UK pavilion mm -hmm. that um, was the studio's project for the Shanghai World Expo in 2010. But got, I got interested, you know when you're scrubbing the floor with a really stiff scr scrubbing brush? It's quite strong. You're there thinking that's quite contained and weight. So this was an experiment with um, there's all those bristles hold, held it up, um, and so those were all timber. Um, and you can see a photograph of it. It's a built uh, built project. So this this was a kind of very low budget artist studios at a university in the in the west side of Britain in Wales. And um, I mean, my, my background was making things, making my own projects. It was the only way to make things happen. And I grew up around many craftspeople. My mother was a jeweler. And uh, so I spent quite a bit of time around people who were making with excellence, with ceramics, with silver, with glass blowing, with marquetry joinery, um, and um, stone carving. and, and um, there was a chance, very low budget, to build nine buildings in Wales. But the only way to make them special was for us to build them ourselves. So we became the contractor, but I mean, unless you made it yourself, it wouldn't happen. Um, and was there thinking, well, stainless steel is a really good material that lasts forever. I watched a program once about it, what would happen if human beings died away and in 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 100,000, 10 million, and the only things that were left were stainless steel cooking pots. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, well, stainless steel is really amazing. And this is a machine called the Crumbler that the studio built in order to get the right texture of the metal that you can see on the full scale mock up over here. London's famous for double decker buses, and, uh, but actually, in it's the last time a bus was designed specially for London was 55 years ago. And in, in the intervening years, society's changed, London's changed. We want mummies with buggies to be able to go on the, go on the bus. Um, and we wanted a bus that used 40% less energy. And so uh, the mayor, also, and we also wanted a bus, again, where you weren't a prisoner on the back when you were a few foot away from your bus stop. We, we, we were um, given the commission to design the uh, Olympic cauldron for London 2012 Games. And then there was the moment with the young athletes who came and lit these individual 204 pieces. Um, and it had never worked before, and uh, because it was always a technical problem, um, hence why they'd said no moving parts. Um, and uh, so up, it did have the most moving parts in the history of all Olympic cauldrons in the end. Um, and it did work. And the 204 pieces lifted, and for two weeks there was one object with a major flame, uh, and then at the end, each of the pieces, these are the two of the test pieces. We thought the copper was a beautiful metal that um, 
maybe wasn't highlighted enough, and it's good for boilers and tanks, and it seems. So these polished pieces became heavily patinated, and then afterwards were sent back to all the different countries. So this cauldron no longer exists. The theme of the World Expo in Shanghai was better city, better life. And so the studio thought about what could it do to work with that theme in creating the UK pavilion. So they decided because there was such a great rich history of parks and gardens in the UK that they could partner with the seed bank at Kew Gardens. It's the, called the Millennium Seed Bank. It's, the, its structure is a simple box, wooden box, but then each of these rods, there's 66,000 of them, and they have fiber optics in their tips on the exterior. On the interior, the tips of the rods were these resin tips that have, each of them has a seed or a group of seeds embedded in it. Going inside that pavilion, I don't know if any of you visited it, but it was really a great experience, kind of sparkly and shiny, but then it also had all of these seeds and people were just mesmerized by this, looking at all of the different seeds. They actually were trying to create the effect of a Union Jack on the exterior. So when you look at the model, you can see how it has that kind of starburst. They weren't sure if they would be able to achieve that, but then they did. And so then at the opening, they said, and by the way, and they actually got first place for the best pavilion. So they created this bridge out of these individual segments that working with hydraulics, it curls on over itself. This bridge, it's not a built project, but they were asked to uh, participate in the Lord Mayor's Parade in London, it's an annual parade, and to put together a float to design a float. So they thought, well, we've been really interested in this, investigating this idea of taking the idea of the single small rolling bridge, which is quite small, and seeing if they could take that idea and translate it into a bridge that could span a larger body of water like the Thames. And so together the studio developed the, what we call informally the double rolling bridge, but it's the official name is the large span rolling bridge. So you can see that cranking the handle causes the pieces to raise and curl off on themselves, creating that opening in the center where large boats could pass through. And in a way, it's the way that it wouldn't operate by a hand crank in real life, but it would actually, that's the way that it would uh, curl up with the wires and the cables. And as many of you know, this is the project for Pier 55 here in Manhattan. And as you also know, there's quite a bit of controversy surrounding, especially the political process of how it came to be and we're celebrating that, the design aspects of the project. It's at the location of Pier 54, which is where the survivors of the Titanic dock. That pier was in quite a bit of disrepair, and so the Hudson River Trust was already looking for solutions to try to um, either restore it or improve it or to, you know, to add to the Hudson River Park. So um, the studio designed not on the existing pier, but creating a new pier, which is why it's given this name, Pier 55. These are development studies for the pots, that, which would be made of concrete. This is a test study for one of the pots. And so they would all be different shapes and sizes and heights to create the park. And then together they would form this um, surface that the, all the planting materials and everything could be planted in. This is a detail of one area of the park. It's actually this corner right here that has the open air amphitheater in it. And so the idea is that it will be a public park and performance space. And I think it's close to 12th Street, 12th and 13th Street. You can see the location here. And the sort of landmark, which um, this image predates is this is the standard hotel and then here's where the highline ends so this is where the new Whitney is.